We're really, really excited to chat with you today. We are going to talk about phenomena and sense making. Uh, for us, this, this is the basis for all of the assessments that we write. Um, when we consult with schools and districts, this is where it all starts um, with a good phenomena and a focus on sense making. <clears throat> So just so you know who I am, so my name is Brendan Finch. I was a high school and middle school science teacher in Los Angeles. I taught for LUSD, KIPP, and Green Dot at both the middle and high school level. If you have any questions during this presentation, you can send me an email at brendan at innerorbit.com. If you have questions about anything that I presented or, or comments on it, or you would just like to chat and I can be helpful with any of the contents that we have or with working on assessments or you want to try piloting Inner Orbit, I would love to chat with you about that. I also want to take a second to chat about what we do. So Inner Orbit is a website that writes rigorous assessments for grades 6 through 12. So we write clusters of questions around phenomena, and teachers or our staff will go in and create assessments for the units that you're working on. So you can have modeling questions and DCI-only questions and getting deep into SCPs and really three-dimensional and focused on phenomena. We also do NGSS assessment reviews. So if you want to schedule a time with me, we'll review one of your assessments for three-dimensionality and NGSS alignment. Uh, we've written thousands of assessment items at this point. And if there's anything we can do to review the assessments that you're giving students and provide you with some support and maybe some suggestions from assessments that we've written and phenomena that we have, um, we'd love to do that. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about what, what is a phenomena. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about using evidence statements to guide sense making. We're going to talk about representations versus sense making. So this is kind of a really important element. Um, in the NGSS, um, especially when it comes to modeling something or, or applying any of the SCP, SCPs. We're going to review a part of the task annotation project for science. This is an achieve, that's called the TAPS, and we'll look at an assessment that they did. We're going to look at an inner orbit assessment to show you just one of our phenomena driven assessments and how you know we look at the three dimensions of the NGSS. And, um, and building assessments for, for those. And then we'll also just have a quick summary for sense making to help you make sense of our presentation on sense making. The first thing that I wanna talk about is, so phenomena and sense making or NGSS aligned. I'm positive that many, if not all of you are here because I've had curriculum materials that were given to you, which were just not quite NGSS aligned. They were called NGSS aligned, but they weren't. One of the things that you'll see in anything that is NGSS aligned are integrations of all three, so practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. As you go through content, I hope that this presentation will help guide just a framework for looking at things that are NGSS aligned, which involve phenomena and sense making, and then things that are not. So the first thing uh, at the very beginning of, of anything is a good phenomenon. If, you're, if your assessment does not involve a phenomena, then it is not NGSS aligned. So elements of a good phenomena, a phenomena must be novel. So if students have seen something before, if they have seen this GIF of the Antarctic ice sheet growing, then you can't use that to assess their application and understanding of something. A Ransom says something that makes students wonder, mm, L Blankenship, something that makes you go, hmm. I think those are excellent. It should be relevant also. So obviously we can be really flexible with our phenomena, but if it's not relevant to students and the content that you're teaching, it's not gonna be simple helpful. Local connections, says Heather Johnston, that's fantastic. If you can make it something that as they're walking or driving to school that they see on the way there, or if you can walk out or even just open the window or you know, show a picture of something in their you know, local neighborhood or, or something even just culturally that would resonate with students, then I think that's fantastic. It should be interesting. So I saw the hmm um, and make students wonder. I think that's all a part of interesting. So even if students go, ew, <laughs> that that's super interesting and engaging. For middle and high school students, I know having things that are relevant and exciting and interesting are essential. You're not going to get a lot out of the assessment unless students are interested in the initial phenomena. T. Kern says the coronavirus and the response to it seems to be the perfect phenomena. Yeah. I think if you're if you're a biology teacher and you're not using the coronavirus, you know, maybe maybe consider chatting about that in your class. This is, this is a, an interesting moment in history. The other thing about phenomena is they should be explained by application of science knowledge. I know that there are phenomena that you'll use in the beginning of a unit to talk about and sort of frame things, but it has to be something that can be explained by the application of knowledge. You really need to think about it thoughtfully as an instructor and make sure that what you're using as a phenomena can be explained 
by science knowledge. Let's look at an example of what maybe not an awesome phenomenon. The first question that uh, you should ask yourself whenever you're looking at a phenomena is, do students need the phenomena to answer a question? And if they don't need the phenomena to answer the question, then that's, that's not a phenomena. Um, so a boiling pot of water. Uh, this is a question that we've seen uh, teachers and districts post and say that this is NGSS and it involves modeling. So it's model how heat changes molecular motion. And so student, it does say the word model in there. So they're doing that. Um, it's a boiling pot of water and I have this, this GIF or GIF, however you think that word is pronounced down there of a boiling pot of water. And this actually isn't a good phenomenon. It's not a specific instance. This is a general common example. If they've studied thermodynamics or heat at all, then it's probably something they've come across. What this question is actually doing is this is recall or representing knowledge. Uh, this is not involving modeling. This doesn't engage them in sense making at all. We're just having them recall something. So this is actually a, if, the, if a question like this appears, it is a DCI only question. It's just getting at the knowledge of, you know, what students know about, you know, molecular motion, you know, with changes in, in heat energy or thermal energy. So this is not a good example of a three-dimensional assessment or a phenomena. So if you have assessments with this, um, I recommend changing it. And guess what? I've got some suggestions for you. So now let's look at a, another example of a phenomenon. This is one that we use on our site, hot air balloon. So use a model to show how heat and molecular motion explain the balloon's movement. So we have this hot air balloon and there's this terrifying event <laughs> that happens where the bottom of it falls out. And I'm only laughing because I wasn't present for this. And I, I imagine it was very, very dangerous for folks that were involved. But as scientists, we can review this later on and say, there is something interesting happening here. So when that bottom drops off of the balloon, the top flies up in the air. And the question that I would like to pose is, you know, how do heat and molecular motion explain the movement of this balloon? So this is a specific instance. It's likely something novel. So even if students have seen hot air balloons or you've done the, you know, holding a balloon over a candle and it explodes and asking students why, this is probably novel. Um, they're applying what they've learned. So if they've learned about why holding a balloon over a candle explodes or any other examples of thermal energy changing molecular motion, they will be applying those concepts they learned to this novel thing. They have to see it to answer questions. And so we have all these little cute little hearts around this because this is a good phenomena. Um, it's specific, it's novel, students are applying what they've learned. They must see this thing in order to answer the questions. Um, so this is an example of a solid phenomena to use in a thermodynamics unit. So finding good phenomena. There are a few resources we've found for this. So ngssphenomena.com does a phenomenal job haha, of some good phenomena. Project Phenomena by San Diego County Office of Education. They have tons of phenomena in there. I'll post all of these links in the YouTube description so you can go in and check them out too. I'd also like to recommend Inner Orbit. <laughs> so we have uh, hundreds of phenomena tied to assessment items that we write three-dimensional questions to. You can try them out for free this spring. But all we do is professionally find these good phenomena and novel, interesting phenomena so that you can assess. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, also, the CAST item specifications. So this, uh, this is for the California science test. Even if you're not in California, this is super helpful. And I'm going to go over these because they're amazing. And a lot of effort obviously went into this document. And I'd love to, to show you around and you know, just walk you through it. First off, they have these assessment targets. So they break down each performance expectation to a bunch of sub um, skills and assessment targets that they expect students to hit. And then also evidence that will show that they've met that assessment target. So it's really specific and you can essentially go in and I'm gonna show you one right now and find a really granular um, skill that you're looking to assess and you can write a question for it and it tells you exactly what students should be doing to meet that. This is an example straight from the CAST item specifications. So the task provides information about energy changes in a chemical system and a list of relevant and irrelevant components to model the system. So that's what the task looks like. If you're a chemistry teacher, you can think of any example of a chemical system where there are energy changes and ask students if this is relevant or this is not relevant. Um, and the evidence that they ask for is they select the relevant components uh, to illustrate the energy changes in the chemical system. And hopefully they will choose wisely. CAST also has possible phenomena or context, a list of you know, potential energy diagrams, um, you know, demonstrating what happens when energy, uh, when reactants are tripled or, or doubled. 
um, et cetera. And these are all really specific examples. If you, you know, if you teach chemistry, I'm sure you can think of lots of phenomena from this. So these are really, really good resources for the California science test item specifications. Really, really helpful when we're writing assessments and um, something that we recommend to other folks to look at as well. The evidence statements are a great litmus test for complexity. We love them because they're divided into sections um, with increasing complexity. So as you go through the evidence statements, the first section provides some background knowledge or basic elements that students should have. So if it's a modeling question, it'll say your model should include A, B, C, D, E. And those are all elements that you could assess students on. Do you know what A, B, C, D, or E are? In the middle, and, and I'm being vague about this because the evidence statements sometimes have three sections, sometimes have eight sections. It totally depends on if it's a high school or middle school and um, exactly what SCP and elements are, you know, involved. The middle has students dive deeper. So they're either identifying evidence, um, they're generating evidence, or they're making connections between different elements. At the end of the evidence statements, you're integrating all three dimensions to meet the performance expectation. So the end of the evidence statements, there's something really, really complex. Students have a CER statement, they use their model to demonstrate blah, blah, blah about chemical reactions. We look at the evidence statements while we write our assessments and we think they're incredibly useful in just scaffolding up what students should be doing in their questions. So in the very beginning, the first part of the evidence statements, components of the model is one example. This is from HSPS 1.4. So what background knowledge will students need? So this is really helpful if you want to do some diagnostic testing, some do nows or warm ups. So students need to understand that there is a chemical reaction. So assessing whether this is a you know, physical or chemical change is important. What are the boundaries of a system? Are their bonds broken? Are the bonds formed? Was there energy transferred? Do you know what collisions are and how those you know, transfer energy. Um, and also, do you know that there are changes in potential energy? So these are all a component, you know, pieces of knowledge that students should have before they even get into this HSPS 1.4. So at the beginning of your unit, as warm-ups, do-nows, um, as little formative assessments, you can have questions on each of these elements to sort of, you know, gauge whether students understand the basic things they need, the basic elements, before they get into the rest of it. Second part of evidence statements, I'm calling these the middle evidence statements, does the student need to show relationships? So typically this is identifying or generating evidence or it's showing relationships or, and, and students should now go a little bit deeper. So now students need to show that changes in energy are from bonds broken and formed. So you can ask students, you know, from the products and the reactants, what sort of change in energy do these different molecules have? And that collisions transfer energy, ask them questions about collisions and how that transfers energy to model that collisions are transferring energy, and then that the total energy in a system is unchanged. So this is a, a really big overarching concept, especially in chemistry, um, where we want to see if the you know, total energy in a system is changed or not. Spoiler alert, uh, total energy is unchanged. I see a question that I want to address. Um, so Com says, how should teachers deal with students who do not have the necessary background knowledge? So I taught in South LA for my career. I had a lot of students that struggled with background knowledge and maybe missed out on a lot of science education and definitely in elementary and, and likely in middle school. But I would look at the DCI for this performance expectation. And I would look at the elements that students should have known in elementary school and in middle school and then up to high school. An easy and simple progression, they have the K-12 progressions on the Achieve website and I'll send out a link to this um, as well. Um, but what you're able to do is you're able to look at what students should have learned in elementary school, like in 3-5 and then in 6-12 and then in 912 for a given DCI. So, you know, for chemical reactions, there is a progress, there's a progression of ideas that students should follow. And you should go back through and look at what they should, you know, should have under, should have learned in 3-5, should have learned in 6-8 and 912, and just go over those in your lesson as you progress, you know, through the unit. I think that's a phenomenal way to identify gaps in your assessments. Um, and also to figure out where students are, if they're you know, a grade level band below where they should be, two grade level bands below or on grade level. Um, and just to throw another plug in, so for inner orbit, um, we write questions for high school that are deliberately assessing middle school level DCIs because in the very, very beginning of, of a topic on chemical reactions, I mean, this really complex um, evidence statement, you know, we need to assess whether students have, you know, have the background knowledge they need to get into this. Uh, do you understand what a chemical reaction is? Can you identify a physical and a chemical change? And those are basic, basic things they, sh they need to know before they can do this complex modeling. So that's, that is my suggestion for dealing with, with students don't have background knowledge. And thank you for asking that question. So the third part of the evidence statements, um, the, we'll call this the final elements, um, are much more complex. They're incorporating all SCPs, DCS, and cross-cutting concepts. 
So students are using a model to illustrate all of these different ideas. So this is, you know, they need to show that there's energy change, um, that there's breaking bonds, that there's energy transferred, that there's some energy transfer during collisions, really, really complex. So students need to draw a model, an image of a system and show that all of these things are there. At the end of the evidence statements, and really this is a great litmus test for the complexity of your phenomena, if you can have students draw a model to explain what's going on and it ticks these boxes or at least a few of these boxes, then you have something that is likely three-dimensional and complex enough to be a good phenomena. If your phenomena does not withstand the test of the last element of the evidence statements, then this is, you probably need to find something more complex in order to best assess students. So for sense making, in all cases, it's gonna be application of knowledge. So if students under, have gone over chemical reactions, then they're gonna apply what they've learned. So if we've talked about magnetism already, then students should be able to apply what they've learned to this. So how can we explain the movement of the copper wire? If they understand magnetic forces and fields, then they should be able to put forth some kind of explanation for this. And then one suggestion that we have is to scaffold, uh, to give context to students. So if you ask students, how can we explain the movement of the copper wire? You may get answers about gravity, about friction. You may get answers about maybe there's somebody like you know, blowing on the copper wire or they spun it, um, or this is like a looped video and it's just some kind of trick. Uh, so I recommend <laughs> scaffolding and giving some context and saying, you know, how can magnetic forces be used to explain the movement of the copper wire just so that you don't get totally off the wall answers from students because, you know, you might. Anytime you can give them some context to scaffold exactly what you're looking for, that's really, really helpful. This falls in line with things like giving a copy of the rubric um, or writing the objective on the board. You know, we just want to give you some context and some, some direction in what we're expecting you to, to be doing. Awesome. So in the last few slides, we're going to talk about phenomena and sense making and the task annotation project in science. This is a project put out by Achieve. It's awesome. And if you want to geek out on assessments, I strongly recommend that you poke around their website. I will send a link to the task that we are looking at today. So first, we're going to look at the heated cup of water. So this is a phenomena that was that's in the task annotation project. So thermal energy is slowly transferred to a cup by heating it in a microwave, but there's no change in the state of the water. Hmm. Imagine you had a very powerful tool that allows you to see how the water molecules are moving after thermal energy is transferred to the water by heating. So there's our phenomena. And what students have to do with this heated cup of water is they have to construct a model to explain the motion of the water molecules before and after the water is heated. Be sure your model includes pictures and key. So um, if we're, they're, they're drawing a model, which is great, that's modeling. And I know that if you, know, if you were paying attention earlier on in the presentation, you know that we're probably going to have some issues with this already. They are definitely drawing a model, and it's something involving molecular motion, which is great. So the TAPS feedback was that it's not a specific instance or observation, because this is sort of a general example. You're not actually asking students to make sense of what's going on, and it can be answered without the scenario. This is really a sophisticated recall question rather than a two or three dimensional question. There's no sense making, but this can be used to assess the DCI. So if we want to understand that students know molecules are moving more when there's more thermal energy or less when there's less thermal energy, this is a great way to assess that. But this is not an assessment of their ability to make sense through a model and to explain phenomena through modeling. Asking students to represent a DCI understanding uh, in a drawing, and uh, it's great scaffolding towards modeling. So they're, they're moving in the right direction. So students need to use diagrams to make their thinking visible. And they have to explain that you know, there's a change in particle motion and molecular motion when heat energy is added or not. Um, so this is a great, a great way to assess the DCI and to build up towards their modeling a phenomena. But this is not an example of, of the SEP um, and of a middle or high school level of this. Definitely not. So for inner orbit, one of the assessments that we have is around sky lanterns. Um, the above GIF you'll see, and this is on our website, again, along with hundreds of others. Um, we'd love to, to show you around and, and have you try it out. But in the above GIF, you see hundreds of sky lanterns being released into the air during a festival. Below, we see a close-up of one of these lanterns. The lanterns are made of paper, closed at the top, and the bottom is open. At the bottom is a flame held in the middle of the open space. Think about how the particles of gas are changing to make the lantern fly up into the air. So um, for that particles of gas at the bottom, um, 
what we're looking to do is give students a little bit of context so that we don't get totally off the wall answers with these questions. So we asked the same question that was asked in the heated cup of water. So draw a model to explain how a change in the particles inside the lantern makes the lantern rise up. Explain how your model shows a change in the particles inside the lantern makes the lantern rise up. So again, essentially asking the exact same things as in the heated cup of water. Um, but the difference is that one involves sense making and one involves representing. So explaining why something is rising up and this, these sky lanterns, which are beautiful examples of, of, of particle physics and density, um, that's making sense of something. Uh, just showing what happens to molecular motion when you, know, you heat a cup of water, you're just, you're just representing. It's just showing that students understand the DCI. What Achieve says about this is that SEPs are used for two purposes. Science tasks can be to represent ideas that students have previously learned, and this is important because we need, they need to have that some kind of background knowledge in order to show and make sense of what's going on. The other thing is that these are, are used to make sense of a phenomena. So an actual three-dimensional assessment is going to make sense of a phenomena or a problem. And so you're going to see students you know, looking at something they've never seen before, something novel, and they are going to use that and the background knowledge they have to make sense of this new thing that they're seeing. So that making sense part is really, really important. I'd advise you to look at all of your assessments and just make sure that students are having to make sense of something novel and that you're not just asking them to show what happens when a cup of water is heated because that's not three-dimensional even though they are modeling it's more of a scaffold up in terms of you know what they should be doing rather than the actual application of the SEP. Just to, to wrap it up, so to be three-dimensional items must have a specific phenomena, it's engaging or problematized, and we're actually gonna talk about problematization um, in a future webinar. DCIs are important for representing, but an SEP is only really present when there's sense-making going on. So when students are applying it to something new, that's where the SEP is being applied. So I just wanna emphasize that constructing a model does not mean you're engaging in modeling. So just because students are drawing something or modeling something does not mean that they're engaging in modeling. However, it can be a good way for them to represent and also scaffold up to that. So students must be making sense of a phenomena to make claims about progress towards SEPs. So in any of your assessments in your curriculum, if you're making claims that students are progressing in their ability to model, it has to be that they're making sense of something novel. You cannot say that they're modeling something that they've seen before and call it you know, progress towards the SEP. That concludes most of the meat of our program. I just wanna put a little plug out that I'd love to meet to chat about your assessments. Well, we're happy to review and improve any assessment you send um, to make the questions and phenomena more NGSS aligned. So that's the end of NGSS Assessment Academy uh, part one. We will have parts two and three and maybe even four and I'll send emails to all of you about that. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Thank you so much for coming.